this video, I wanted to provide an introduction to central limit theorems. So in order to start thinking about this concept, we're first going to think about a sequence of random variables, so sort of x1, x2, through to xn. And then we're going to think about what happens if we take the sort of sample mean of those sort of n observations, so we have sort of 1 over n times sort of x1 plus x2, all the way through to xn. Well, then we know from the weak law of large numbers that actually xn bar tends in probability to the sort of population mean mu, where the population mean mu refers to the mean of an individual xi. So we're assuming that each of the xi comes from the same distribution and it has a mean of mu. Furthermore, we know because convergence in probability is stronger than convergence in distribution, that convergence in probability actually implies convergence in distribution. So xn bar actually converges in distribution to that of a constant. But what does it actually mean to converge in distribution to a constant? Well, the idea is that if I had a population, and from that population I took a load of repeated samples, so I took a sample S1, another one S2, and sort of I continued that and took many samples all the way up to sort of SP. And then for each of those samples, if I then for each of those samples calculated a value of xn bar, so from the first sample I'd get xn bar 1, so the 1 here just means in the first sample, the second sample I'd get sort of xn bar 2, and then in the sort of pth sample I'd get xn bar p, with all of these values which I've then obtained from each of these samples, I could then draw a frequency distribution of these. So this frequency distribution here would, for example, tell us the frequency of each of the different values of xn bar which I've obtained in all of the different samples. And for a moderately sized sample, our sort of frequency distribution might look something like that. And we know because the sample mean is an unbiased estimator of the population mean, that our sort of frequency distribution is going to be centered around the sort of population mean mu. So this might represent the frequency distribution for, let's say, n of 100. So what happens to my frequency distribution as I increase the size of the sample? Well, the answer is it sort of becomes more sort of sharply distributed around mu, so it becomes narrower around mu. So this sort of blue line which I've drawn here might represent the sort of sample size of 10,000. So each of those samples that I've taken from my population now is composed of a sample of 10,000 individuals. Well then, convergence and distribution to a constant, mu, means that essentially at n is inf infinite, I just get a straight line at mu. So that's the sort of purple line which I've tried to indicate here. So that means that in each of my samples, if I then calculate the sort of sample mean, I will always get the population mean mu. And in a sense, convergence in distribution to a constant essentially means that a variable has no real sampling distribution. It's just a straight line. So it doesn't really mean anything to talk about it as having a distribution. One thing that I haven't spoken about as yet is how fast does xn bar tend in distribution to mu? Or diagrammatically, as I've drawn it here, how fast does my sort of sampling distribution approach the sort of purple line at mu? So how, how fast does it converge to this sort of straight line at mu? Well, actually, a nicer way to think about how fast does xn bar tend in distribution to mu is actually to say, how fast does xn bar minus mu converge in distribution to zero? And it turns out that we can sort of illustrate this quite well graphically. If I draw a graph of the modulus of xn bar minus mu, because xn bar can sort of be either above or below mu, and we're just sort of interested in how far it is away from mu, not whether it's sort of above or below mu. If we draw a graph of that against n, oh sorry, I should be using n in each of these sort of expressions here, then it turns out that it actually looks something like this where the functional form of this graph in question is actually given by 1 over n to the power of half. So what does it actually mean to converge at a rate of 1 over n to the half? Well, it means that if I increase my sample size by a factor of 100, 
Then the sort of deviations of xn bar from mu go down on average by a factor of 10 because 100 to the power of half is 10. So a question which you might be interested to sort of find out would be, what happens if I multiply my sort of xn bar minus mu by the sort of factor of n to the half? And the reason we might ask this question is because we know that xn bar minus mu converges in distribution to zero. We've just got that, this bottom relationship here. So as n gets really big, this thing in, inside the parenthesis gets really, really small and it converges to zero. But this factor of n to the half here, as n gets bigger, n to the half goes to infinity. What happens to it in terms of what, does it sort of what is its sort of limiting distribution? Well, it turns out that a particular central limit theorem, which we call the lindbergh levy central limit theorem, which concerns xi, which are iid, so that means that they are independent, so the first i means that they're independent, and the sort of id means that they are identically distributed, so that means that they all come from the same population process, or in other words, they all come from the same population, then the lindbergh levy central limit theorem, because there are many central limit theorems, says that n to the half times this sort of term in the parenthesis here actually tends to a non-degenerate distribution, which is a normally distributed random variable with a mean of naught and a variance of sigma squared where the sort of sigma squared is the variance of an individual xi. And it's hard to stress how important central limit theorems are. I haven't assumed anything about the distribution of these individual xi, so these individual xi could be, for example, sort of uniformly distributed on the range sort of 0-1, so that might be the sort of CDF here, or they might be sort of t-distributed, so that sort of looks something like that. Then the central limit theorem, or the lindbergh levy central limit theorem, says that if I pre-multiply this xn bar minus mu by this factor of n to the half, then as my sample size goes to infinity, then my sort of CDF of this sort of product term here actually is a given distribution. And it's a normally distributed random variable with a mean of zero and a variance of sigma squared. And this is independent of the distribution of the individual x's. So the idea is that we can actually draw this CDF. We could draw the CDF for a normally distributed random variable with a mean of sort of naught and a variance of sigma squared. And it would look something like that where I'm sort of centering it on naught. And the width of this distribution here is given by sigma squared. So this is, sorry, this isn't the CDF. This is the PDF of this particular random variable. And this is actually the PDF of the limiting distribution of this sort of composite term on the left here. So what are we actually doing? Well, you can kind of think about what we're doing in terms of magnification. Essentially what we're doing is we're saying, well, if we could magnify this sort of purple line which I've drawn up here, right? So if we could sort of magnify it sort of infinitely in this case, so by multiplying it by a factor of n to the half, essentially, then that means that we actually have a non-degenerate distribution, which is sort of given by this distribution which I've drawn here. So you can sort of think about central limit theorems as sort of magnifying the sort of deviations of x bar n from mu. Uh, and it's magnifying at a rate of n to the half. And I want to talk about a common misuse of the central limit theorem. Well, you might think the, the way in which the central limit theorem is written, that it is okay to divide both sides by n to the half. So I'd actually get a normally distributed random variable with a variance of sigma squared over n. It's over n because the variance of a normally distributed variable, if you sort of times a normal random variable by a factor of a, where a is a constant, then the variance goes up by a factor of a squared. So that's why I've got a sort of a variance of one over n in this sort of bracket here rather than a variance of sigma squared over n to the half. But it actually turns out that this is actually complete nonsense because we already know that this term in the parenthesis here is converging in distribution to zero. In other words, it doesn't have a distribution. So to say that it is normally distributed with a variance of sigma squared over n actually doesn't make any sense, even though we could sort of think about this sort of variance term here as going to zero as n goes to infinity.
The bottom line is we can't divide 3 by this factor of n to the half because essentially we are letting n go to infinity and it's this n to the half which is stopping this sort of convergence of xn bar minus mu to a completely degenerate distribution at mu. So we actually can't divide 3 by n to the half. However, we are able to divide 3 by a constant. So if we divide both sides by sigma, then it turns out that we get a sort of 1 over sigma times the stuff on the left-hand side. And now we get this sort of tending to a distribution of which is normally distributed with a mean of 0 and a variance of 1. And the variance has come down to 1 because of the fact that the variance of sort of a times a random variable x is equal to a squared times the variance of x, where our sort of a here is 1 over sigma. So the variance has gone down by a factor of 1 over sigma squared, which takes it down to 1. And um, we were able to divide through by sigma because essentially sigma isn't changing as n goes to infinity, whereas this n term here is changing as n goes to infinity. Okay, so in the next few videos, I'm going to provide some intuition for the central limit theorems. And we're actually going to go ahead and prove the central limit theorem for the case of IID random variables.